So you could really see the decline in the generations. And, and I think it was Clemens who really gave us the insight that one of the major issues that's happening with, with these communities that's impacting their health is the schools. So the schools have come in with an altruistic attempt to educate uh, everyone. But the problem is, is that these schools are feeding the children corn and beans, and this is not a traditional Maasai diet. And so, I, you know, the kids are coming home saying that maize is healthy for us, we should be eating maize, vegetable oil is healthy, these kind of things, and then eating their traditional foods uh, for breakfast and for dinner. And it's causing it's causing uh, confusion, and, and I really think we're gonna see even more of the generational decline in health as this continues. Yeah, that's the next thing I wanted to bring up. Mm -hmm. We visited a school and we saw three full classrooms of these kids. And I mean, yeah, it seemed like the younger ones weren't doing as well. You know, you kind of mm -hmm. see a little bit of this stuff going on. And, and they showed us their food shed, which was quite alarming. And in there was a couple little sacks of sugar, some jugs of vegetable oil, and a big trash can full of maize flour. And they're like, this is their food. So while they're at school, this is what they eat. And I'm like, oh man, this looks like we set this up for the Food Lies film about how bad it could be. Because yes. you just lined up the three worst things. You got the sugar flour oil and that's all they have. Yeah, it, uh, it really looked like a setup and it was so depressing. Eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. <laughs> welcome back from the break, everyone, and welcome to season nine of the Peak Human Podcast. I'm Brian Sanders, and I'm back from Africa with some stories. What an epic journey. I went there with Mary Ruddock, her boyfriend Draco, who helped film, and director, filmographer Jay, to spend some time with the native living tribes to learn from them and get footage for the Food Lies film. For new listeners, Food Lies is a feature-length documentary I've been working on for years. I've interviewed many of the top doctors, nutrition experts, and regenerative agriculturists around the world, and I'm now in the final stages of post-production. You can find the very outdated trailer and some great highlight clips on the Food Lies YouTube channel. You can also find out about all that we're doing at sapien.org and link to the film page from there. This is a special episode today with the nutrition genius Mary Ruddick, who graciously planned this whole trip. I definitely recommend watching the video version of this podcast on the Food Lies YouTube so you can see Mary's radiant healthy face as well as photos of what we are talking about. This episode is just on the Maasai tribe in Tanzania. We visited two main communities and talk about all that we learned from our time with them. We'll have three more episodes coming out soon, covering all the tribes and clans we spent time with. You'll hear some super unique first-hand experience with one of the few groups of people in the world still living close to how they live for thousands of years. The Maasai are the people where the men live mostly on meat, blood, and milk. Spoiler alert, Mary and I drank the fresh blood and milk straight from the cow. Super cool experience along with a ton of other stuff we learned on how they are so healthy and live so long. Just to remind everyone, this show takes on no advertisers or outside funding and is made possible by my organizations Nose to Tail and Sapien. We have the sustainably raised grass-fed meat, body care products, seasonings, and more at nosetail.org, and we have our physician-supervised weight loss and disease reversal program at sapien.org. If you're familiar with these great products and services, feel free to skip ahead to the start of the show. We have so many great stories coming in from email or social media from customers telling us how much they love these products. The Primal Ground Beef is still our most popular product. That's with the liver, heart, kidney, and spleen mixed in the ground beef. Really great stuff. Great way to get your organs in, in the whole food form with all the nutrients, none of the hassle. Our other most popular stuff is the skin care, the skin food made from regenerative beef tallow, made by hand, very few ingredients. Skin food is what your skin wants. Your skin is an organ. It needs to be fed properly. And beef tallow is the best thing it can get, really. We also have soap, lip balm, deodorant's coming soon. We have baby balm, it's unscented, very gentle and mild for all your baby needs. We also have the high omega-3, low omega-6 pork and chicken. It's our specialty. You can get all those products fresh. You can make a box, get free shipping over 20 pounds, all 48 states, not Hawaii, Alaska, sorry. We also have seasonings that go great with the meat. 
I use at least one of these daily. I'm really big on the Sweet Dreams, which is sort of a chai warm flavor like pumpkin pie or banana bread or eggnog even with that cardamom and cinnamon and allspice and nutmeg and clove. It's great. We have seasonings for fish. We have seasonings for beef. We have it for chicken. We have all the good ones without any of the fillers or MSG or any of that stuff, all freshly ground and high quality. Add those onto your meat box. We also have the biltong and drovors. I took this stuff to Africa and it was so useful. I ate it on the plane. I gave it to the Hadza who loved it, who devoured it. I gave it to each tribe I visited and it was gone in seconds. This is a traditional South African meat snack. It's cured with just vinegar, just a few spices, air dried slowly, very soft, not like jerky where it's all dried out. You can get all of these at nosedale.org. Also, if you're looking to jump into the sapien diet and lifestyle, we've had tons of great success stories, including my good friend from UCLA, who I posted about recently, who has lost an insane amount of weight and changed his whole body composition and health over the past seven months. During the lockdown, he changed his life and became a health risk to no risk at all. He feels amazing. He's out in the sun. He's eating sapien foods. He's doing OMAD one meal a day. We can customize a diet for you with Dr. Gary. We can do this remotely so you don't have to be in LA. If you are in LA, you can come down to Evolve Healthcare in Woodland Hills. Just look up Dr. Gary, Woodland Hills, Evolve Healthcare, or come online, sapien.org. We can get you going on our virtual program with all our videos and health coaches and all that. So sapien.org, join the Sapien tribe to support the show and be part of the community. We do live Zoom calls with Dr. Gary and I, get the extended show notes, get a big discount on nose and tail products, all kinds of perks there. Find that at sapien.org as well. And enjoy this one. Can't wait for you to hear about our trip with the spectacular Mary Ruddick. Here we go. And we're live with Mary Ruddick once again. How are you doing? I'm so well, thank you. Oh, great to hear. We had an amazing 17 days traveling together and now you're in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you flew to Cape Town, I'm home. Let's lay it out for everyone. We went on an adventure to Africa. We went to Tanzania and Uganda. We saw about eight different tribes or communities. And this is an episode that's going to lay out all that we learned. This is not just us talking about our fun trip. This is an an educational podcast about what we learned from these tribes. And we got a lot of great questions from people from social media. And we're going to do one episode uh, per tribe. So we're going to start with the Maasai because those are the first people we spent time with. And... uh, Yeah, if you don't know Mary, you're crazy. Uh, No, you uh, could go back to my two episodes I did with her. People love those. Always get comments. That was the best episode ever. I love Mary. All this stuff. And traveling with Mary, I've decided she's even more of a genius. Before, I I was like, Mary's a genius. She's a Sherlock Holmes at health. I had all these uh, great ideas about her, and then they were cemented even more, spending time with her. So <laughs> we'll get into all that. But uh, really impressed with very man. We were, you know, we were in the car, and I just asked a question. Hey, what about this? And you'd rattle off like everything I've ever wanted to hear about that <laughs> disease, or you. how to reverse it, or <laughs> amazing, amazing. So. Mary is amazing. Go back and listen to the first two episodes so you have some more context of who she is. And uh, she's going to be part of the Food Lies film. And tell us, Mary, why are you, why are you so interested in visiting the Maasai and going on this trip? Thank you. So I've, for many years, I've wanted to go and study in many parts of Africa. And, and specifically, I wanted to go and study with the Maasai because when I was sick and I was bedbound, it was reading about the Maasai and what, what seems like their extreme diet that got me to really uh, flip the food pyramid upside down and, and really dive deeper into nutrition. Ultimately, learning about the Maasai helped me get into my own healing. And it was a very moving experience for me when I first read about them. And I've used them often in my practice to explain to people how a carnivore diet can be vitally healthy and can really help one in their in reversing a health condition, establish, establishing health. So 
I've been thinking over the last several years, it would be really nice to go to all of these regions that I've read about and actually see for my own eyes if these things were true, because the, the perception that I got from my research was that these regions really existed in a state of almost utopian health, where they just don't get health conditions. Uh, they live to old age and they die in their sleep. And so I, I, I designed this trip to go and see if this was true, not just with the Maasai, but with many other uh, communities as well. And then, of course, you and I met and we made this happen together. <laughs> oh, yeah. So <laughs> exciting. So, yes, this was for the Food Lies film, but it was also for our personal knowledge and, yeah, Mary's life goals and just confirming all this. And and really, the, the high level view is everything that I've read about and heard about is uh, completely confirmed. These people live very healthy lives. It's amazing. Is, is that your high level takeaway? I was honestly blown away. I thought that their health would be worse now than what I had read about, especially in Weston A. Price's book from so long ago. And yeah, that was my takeaway as well. They are radiant, far more healthy than I expected. Just they, yeah, we're going to go into each detail, but just to, just, just to catch people's attention from the beginning, <laughs> It was quite amazing. They didn't know what, you know, just being sore was or, you know, having menstrual pain or to be depressed or to not be able to sleep. Like none of these things existed. It's it, like in a general sense, the, the people who are older and eating the more traditional diets, they just died of old age and they lived well until then. So we're, we're going to go into all the details here. And yes, we're starting with Maasai because we actually stayed in a homestay in a modernized Maasai uh, family in Arusha, right? So this, we flew into Mount Kilimanjaro, this is in Tanzania, and we stayed with a modern family that sort of integrated in the city. So maybe you could start there. Well, that was just fascinating because Arusha is a big city in Tanzania and this homestay was just outside of it. So still still pretty bustling. People are on tr uh, modern diets at this point in this region, although not, not quite Americanized. You know, they've got maize, they have vegetable oil, these kind of things. But it was interesting because they had set up a a Maasai demonstration for us by a, a young man. He's what, in his 20s? <laughs> and he looked mm -hmm. like anyone from America, to be perfectly honest. So I assumed maybe his grandparents had grown up in a Maasai village, something like this. And so it was very eye-opening to see that actually he, or to learn rather, that he had actually grown up until he was 18 in a traditional Maasai village and had only moved out and become more modernized in the last bit. We learned so much from him, actually. It was it was eye opening because I think it's very easy as you travel to write things off or to see things as maybe touristy or to see something as not legitimate. And I think it would have been very easy upon just looking at this man to do that. And yet he had some of the most fascinating stories from his upbringing. And it was it was very interesting because he still to this day when he goes home is held to the the Maasai tradition. So he needs to wear Maasai clothes when he goes home to visit his parents. He needs to eat the Maasai diet when he goes home. Uh, there are certain rituals he has to do when he goes home to be accepted into the village. And so, so it was really great to hear this from him, especially starting off the trip, because we later as you know, we went to go see two other Maasai communities and some of the insights that he brought were really helpful in formulating questions for the other communities as well. For instance, he discussed uh, his rite of passage that he went through. So both Maasai boys and girls go through a rite of passage and it's it's actually very important in, in the Maasai culture. I think a lot of the rites of passage uh, from an outsider's view, uh, at least my take, is that they, they're for building character. Uh, I heard many accounts of the women that their rite of passage, once they went through it, they never had fear after that, you know, because they had gone through something very, very intense. And so I mm. think it was for building character, but his, his story of spending three months in the woods and learning how to hunt was really quite fascinating because for those of you that don't know, the Maasai are not hunters. In fact, they look down on hunters, but when they're on their male, uh, well, their, their journey from childhood or boyhood to malehood, they spend three months at least in the jungle hunting and learning how to hunt. And this is also, you know, their hunting skills are mainly for protection from lions and things like that when they're, when they're protecting the herd. 
But yes, yeah, so his name is Augustine, and he was fascinating to talk to because he's really lived in both worlds and still continues to do so. Yeah, it was. And I was had no sleep and severe <laughs> jet lag during this time, so I missed some of it. But uh, it was interesting to, yeah, they did a little demonstration of how they eat, too, and the, the cooking methods. And it was just these modern things it's like let's grind up some corn and eat some beans in a pot and i was like oh no this is this doesn't look good yes yeah, so he was from perhaps one of the more modernized maasai so there's really kind of from from what i can see three different levels of maasai livelihoods right you've got the traditional who still do just the blood the milk and the meat and then you have the kind of in between where sometimes they'll have maize or the children will have maize at school and and beans and we'll talk about the school system <laughs> soon and then because mm -hmm. uh, that goes into augustine as well and then you have more of like augustine's village that does the maize and beans about once a day but also does the blood and the milk so much so that when he went off to school, his mother would send him with a with a, a little gourd full of the, the milk and the blood for him to drink. So he wasn't eating the other food. But yes, his food demonstration was with corn and beans, not not traditional Maasai foods at all. But it is what that village considered uh, traditional, because that's what they've been eating for the last 80 years or so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it didn't taste good. It did not taste good at all. <laughs> it didn't taste oh. good. Uh, yeah, I woke up from a little nap and it was dinner time and uh, it was just like some pasty mush with no flavoring. So No flavoring at all. They, the Maasai just do not use any salt at all and they pride themselves on that. They also don't use any spices or flavorings. And with the meat and the milk, you don't need it. It's delicious. But with the, with the tribes that do or the communities that do the the corn and the bean, I, I mean, I would get pretty thin. I think it's a great diet food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we, we can start to talk about the pr preparation methods because mm -hmm. that's big people, you know, heard Dr. Bill Schindler. I've had one a couple of times and these traditional methods. And maybe you can tell us about the, the correct way to to prepare maize. Yes, so maize, it's very important that it goes through a five-step process, including stone grinding, fermentation, releasing the niacin is of utmost importance for that to be a, a proper food in the human diet. And that, that knowledge was really lost when the Europeans brought corn or maize from the Americas over to the rest of the world. So the rest of the world really doesn't go through that five-step process with maize. And I think that's what contributes to a lot of problems because it, it at least appears as such that you can be quite healthy on it if you have a healthy microbiome, if you're in a healthy state, and if you go through those five steps beforehand, obviously. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had so many cultures coming out of South America and Central America. But that's not done with the Maasai. They're not aware of that step or those five steps. And the beans really were were not soaked overnight. They weren't sprouted. They do take uh, several hours to cook. But again, it's not going to reduce the lectins to a significant amount. If if I had to guess based on that presentation, it's probably about 50% uh, lectin reduction. But I, you know, I don't know if you want to go into this now or later, but I definitely saw a difference uh, in the communities that had the milk, like the Maasai did, and their overall level of health despite the corn and the beans, as opposed to communities that brought in the maize, like the like the Hudsa that we're going to talk about later, and didn't have the milk. I, I did see a big difference there. Augustine himself seemed vitally healthy, but of course he's still young. Yeah. Well, there, there, we can start talking about this high level stuff because that was one of the big trends we saw is it, it, you know, they didn't have the packaged foods. They didn't have all the processed stuff that we do, but you could see some of them getting unhealthy. And the really only thing that makes sense is because they didn't prepare these foods properly. And so they were getting all these anti-nutrients and that that was part of the problem and or they didn't get enough of the animal foods they didn't have the milk yes yeah definitely like with the with the maasai that have brought in a bit of the corn they seem to have maintained their health despite the corn uh, especially the some of the later communities that we visited that use it very rarely or it's just the children getting it at school at least at this point i think you know one thing that i've i've deeply noticed in all these years of research is that generationally is a different story than right now and so uh, you know the younger generation may be at more risk but uh but at least the maasai have the milk and 
And for those of you who, who don't know out there, the milk and whey contain a lectin blocker. So it can actually help to prevent the, the corn lectin and the bean lectin from attaching to the cell and causing harm. And so it's not a foolproof program, but it does help. And the fact that the Messiah also do the bone marrow, there's another one in there that can help block it. Um, and that gives them a bit of protection, especially given the fact that other foods haven't been adopted. You don't see chips and these kind of foods brought in. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So maybe we could just go straight into our first big Maasai experience. So that was, you know, in right outside the city of Arusha. Then we drove, I don't know, five hours and made it out to, you know, the it was amazing. Mount Kilimanjaro was in the background. We we're in the, these plains. We we're on this little hill, amazing little, um, I guess, place where people like us can stay. So it wasn't exactly in their community, but what was really cool is the the members of the Maasai that lived traditionally would walk up. It was kind of funny. I was like, oh, how'd you guys get there? Like, where where do you live? And they're like, oh, we live like five kilometers away. I'm like, how'd you get here? They're like, oh, we walked. I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> of course. Like, what else are they gonna do? So uh, they, they you know, joined us and um, yeah, t maybe you could tell us about that. Yeah, it was lovely. We got to stay in traditional Maasai houses that have been updated. <laughs> so there, it's the traditional cow dung uh, walls that are created with the hay and the grasses. And they're really quite lovely, to be honest, and very clean, no scent, and uh, and very nice places to stay. But they, they have a toilet, which is really nice. So they, they made it <laughs> easier for us. Yeah. Yes. They put a, a solar panel on it, mm -hmm. and but also it made a great uh, temperature. It really yes. regulated the temperature well. Yeah, I noticed perfectly. That. It was I mean, out. very yeah. livable, very livable. I, I would honestly fully move into one of those. So that was really nice. Mm -hmm. And it was right in the center of several Maasai villages right around. And so the Maasai uh, villagers would come up to where we were staying. It was owned and run by the Maasai and that's why it was in a traditional Maasai format. And it was fantastic because on the first night they did not disappoint immediately. Uh, they took us on a bit of a walk. We met an elder named Clemens and uh, spent mm -hmm. a lot of time with him, got to do a great interview with him and then immediately slaughtered the goat and began drinking the blood and doing many of the traditional Maasai uh, dietary traditions, which for me, having just read about them was fascinating because if I were to write about what we saw, I, I think a lot of misinterpretations would happen. And I think I misinterpreted a lot from my readings. It's very different when you're actually there. For instance, Clemens, the elder that we spent so much time with, uh, he kept talking about this herb soup that he would eat every day and that the Maasai typically eat after they have meat. Uh, and from it, it sounded like there was like greens in there and vegetables and all sorts of things. <laughs> and it turned out <laughs> it was not. It was basically the intestines and the colon and a bit of the lung from the goat that was cooked into a broth. And then they have this uh, plant that grows all over the region that has very bitter herb or bitter roots rather. And they would dig that up and put the roots into the broth while it was cooking. And, and then once it was done cooking and they'd cook it for about five hours, anywhere from two to five hours, uh, they would strain everything. So it, this soup that they're talking about, or this, uh, this herb soup that they talk about is actually a broth with zero fiber in it, which was fascinating to learn about and also fascinating to consume. It was very interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. <laughs> I will jump in here. So we'll, we skipped the, the slaughtering of the goat part. We could come back to that. But we we ate the goat. And uh, oh, man, I, I think we need to start from the beginning. Okay. okay. So they slaughtered the goat for us. They, uh, they cut the neck and bled it into a bucket. And then the main guy, I forget his name. We called him Ling Ling. Mm -hmm. he, his name was similar to that. He just started drinking it. He he actually went into the neck and just drank the blood out of the neck. Uh, then Mary and I got to try the blood, which was pretty interesting, pretty mild. I thought it tasted fine. I did too. Um, I actually really enjoyed it, which surprised me. I thought it would taste uh, like copper, like minerally. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't, I'm usually sensitive around animal deaths for all that I promote animal eating. I'm usually mm -hmm. sensitive to actually seeing the act. And I, 
I, because it was, I think, such a part of their culture, and I felt so honored to be included uh, in that event. I didn't have any of those feelings at all. And uh, when I got to drink the the blood right out of the goat, it was warm and sweet and to be honest mm. delicious to me it was like it felt very nourishing it reminded me of the first time i ever had liver where it felt um it felt vitally healthy like it was something my body mm. really enjoyed really needed it, yeah it was a fascinating experience and you're right he just went right in didn't use the cup i mean he used the cup too but also just drank directly mm -hmm. from the animal <laughs> It, it was crazy. And yes, it didn't have that mineral taste and it tasted fine. But then, so then they slaughtered it, you know, they had the four legs and they were using their knives, opening it up, doing all these things. There was intestines everywhere. There was the insides of intestines were spreading everywhere. And the guy, they took the liver. So I was, you know, excited to eat the raw liver. And then I saw there was just sludge. There was like intestinal sludge on it. It was yellow and green. And he just slight use the same knife and then just gave it to me and i was like uh okay i guess i have to eat it so i ate it and you know it again very mild it was fine and then mary came later and got a piece and maybe you could tell us what happened when i cut a piece yeah when you got a piece and you noticed some white things in oh, the gosh. liver. You know, I had actually totally forgotten about that. So yeah, so they handed me the liver. And again, I just had the blood and it was so exhilarating. And I was excited. And I was like, yes, let's have raw liver with the Maasai. This is a dream come true. And they hand it to me and there are white liver flukes all through, <laughs> throughout mm. it. You can just see, you can see the parasites, but I just ate it anyway. And I didn't tell anyone. <laughs> <until after. laughs> so it was so funny because I ate it first and I noticed there was something a little white, but it was just, it all happened so fast in the moment I ate it. And then we're at dinner and Mary's telling us this like an hour and a half. It was, no, it was hours later. And we're like, Mary, why didn't you tell us? Like, this is insane. And she was just, I was like, I don't know. It just got, I got caught up in the moment. I couldn't say no. And so this was so funny. So this was right after dinner. And I go up into the room and I'm just getting wormwood. You know, wormwood uh, is anti-parasitic that Mary told us to bring. I was taking malaria pills, which are anti-parasitic. <laughs> uh, and we were fine. Uh, the end of the story is we were absolutely fine. But uh, I, I'll, I'll pick back up the story when we, we ate the goat. So, they, yeah, they, they uh, quartered it, you know, cleaned it up, did all their things, put it on wooden sticks around the fire. And it would kind of smoke, it would heat and smoke. You know, it took, I don't know, an hour, more than an At hour. Least. Just of I think the, it was about two. Mm -hmm. Two hours. It was it was nice uh, because it wasn't direct heat. And the whole time they were doing the soup, right? And <laughs> they have this big boiling pot of just mush and intestines. And I uh, saw the rectum. Uh, it turned over in the soup and I saw green and yellow stuff coming out of the rectum. And that was not cool. Um, but I did eat the soup at the end. <laughs> you did. And I was very proud of you. <laughs> you guys looked very questionable. Um, Draco mm -hmm. is Mary's boyfriend and they were just they're like, yeah, it was something. <laughs> And I came later and I was, and I, and I drank it and it did taste like it was poop soup. It was definitely <laughs> poop soup. It was definitely so, poop soup. And it was very, it was so bitter. It tasted like stool plus the most bitter herb you've tasted. And the herb that they use probably has berberine. I've brought samples so that we can identify it later, but, uh, but it's got the yellow color that, uh, that is often used as an antiparasitic, the berberine. And so it's very likely that this soup protects them from infection. And that's that's part of kind of their oral tradition. Many people speculated that that was the case and that that was very important, that it stimulated digestion and these kind of things, which bitter, bitter herbs will do. They stimulate bile in particular. But yeah, no, it was fascinating because we did the the raw liver. <laughs> and to be honest, I, I feel bad I didn't tell anyone, but I was I was caught up in the moment. And also I felt like, well, they clearly aren't worried about it. So let's go mm -hmm. for it. And then they shared the raw kidney as well, which was actually quite delicious. I don't usually like kidney and it was nice. It was nicer than the liver. And then the rest of the organs were put into that soup pot. 
And then they cooked the, the meat for a long time and sat us down. And, uh, and then we sat down for the feast. And it was fascinating because they would take the, the meat off the side of the fire and they had a stick going through it that they had just collected, uh, you know, in the bush and stuck it into the ground. And then everyone kind of sat around that in little pods. Uh, there was maybe four pods going on eating the meat. And one Maasai member would cut off the meat and hand it uh, to each person. So you would get one bite at a time and then the next person would get a bite. It was very communal. It, it was really cool. Yeah, and we got the chest throat area that didn't seem too meaty or <laughs> desirable <laughs> to uh, Western people like myself. Uh, so the first piece we got, we chewed for five minutes and we couldn't chew through it. And, <laughs> but he kept handing it to us. So we, I, I finally, I just like took it, I kind of like threw it away really quickly and then went to the next one. Maybe this next one's not so chewy, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we were eating some weird parts. Like, I don't know what it was, but um, it was leathered. We called it the leathered goat. It was finely leathered. It was and, very uh, leathered. And it was fascinating because the area that they gave us, they said that they tend to give to the children. And I don't know how their teeth can get through that meat because it is so tough. But then, you know, looking at all of the, the men and women, they had such chiseled jaws. And you can see if you're eating meat that tough, where you would get those chiseled jaws. We just don't chew like that in America. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it was, it was interesting. So no salt yeah. again, but uh, yeah. you know, we just went through that entire piece of the animal cause we, he just kept offering and we kept going. Then they got a leg and I was really excited that we got a leg next yeah. and it was still leather. Still tough. It's still, still so tough. Still tough. I, I think we were, Realizing that maybe because the goat was kind of stressed out when they killed it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Either way, it wasn't a fine culinary experience, but we, <laughs> we ate a lot of it. And then we had a whole other meal. So apparently that was just the appetizer. So we had our own meal and then we had the soup. And then, yes, it does make more sense that the soup did help them. It was medicinal. They kept talking about how it was medicinal. So I could see how. Yes. Yeah, there's something there. Yeah, and I, I was in, <laughs> I had heard from Draco about the rectum in the soup, and so I think I wouldn't have been as excited to to try it if I hadn't have seen the parasites in the liver, because I felt like I probably need whatever medicine they're taking after <laughs> after having those parasites. So it was definitely worth it. Um, but yes, uh, the goat. For those of you listening. We were interviewing Clemens the Elder on uh, on video for a long time, and so the rest of the Maasai tribe kept calling us over to do to do the goat uh, ritual, and we weren't coming, we weren't coming. So they had the goat away from the herd for much longer than usual, and most mm -hmm. likely, uh, we don't know, but I I would speculate that that caused the meat to be a bit tough because the actual killing of the goat was was I thought very quick and gentle, mm -hmm. but it was it was away from its herd, which can the animal yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah and so where should we go next so that was our first day it was amazing <laughs> yes. um very cool yeah uh, oh what i was gonna say is we we never i didn't have the slightest bit of trouble the entire trip we're eating all kinds of weird stuff we're eating stuff with dirt in it we're eating stuff with intestines and bile and all kinds of crazy stuff and i had zero stomach problems i had zero anything like 100%, like more than America, like, like more than in the US. Like in the US, I might eat with friends on the weekend. Yes. And my son was like, oh, maybe that wasn't good. I was fine, 100% the entire trip. Yeah, it was incredible. All four of us were. And this is, this is with not clean water, right? We don't have access to clean water most of the places we were. So like brushing your teeth, washing your face, these kind of things aren't safe activities with the tap water or, you know, water in the streams, these kind of things. And so it's actually really amazing that all four of us did so well. None of us had any issues. And here, we were in the tail part of the rainy season with malaria, with all sorts of infections. And that was really interesting. So the next day after the, after the goat ceremony, 
We spent a lot of time interviewing many of the Maasai members, and it was a great place to do this because they were coming from all these little villages within, you know, about five kilometers of there. So we got to see a lot of differences and uh, and a difference in the health as well. And uh, these these men and women were glowing with health. Their skin was glowing. Their teeth were incredible. They were strapping. They were strong. And uh, Clemens, the, the elder I keep bringing up, really really put me to shame that night. He goes for a run every morning up up a hill or what we would call in Ohio a mountain. And uh, <laughs> and he went to show me the, the sunset that night on the second night. And he ran up the hill and I, I couldn't keep up with him. He really put me to shame. And uh, at the top of the hill, he allowed me to take his blood sugar, which was a great thing. We got to test the blood sugar and ketones of a number of the tribe there. And it was, I think, 67 seven we've got it on video so we can we can show everyone mm. later but yeah it was it was really quite impressive uh discussing and uh talking with all of those messiah members yeah that it was so cool and we went on a bluff the other night too it yeah. was an amazing experience they did their traditional dancing and chanting and man these guys had hops they were jumping like over 30 inches it's just it's kind of like who can jump higher type of thing yes. with these cool grunting sort of chanting things it was so cool the sunset this is going to be the ending of our film just a little preview here for food lies we had the drone going and uh i i stood up there with clemens and the sunset oh man so amazing <laughs> it was but, really uh, beautiful to watch you guys do that <laughs> that was really cool. And then we also went to a, we walked a few kilometers to a little, I don't know what it was, a family in their hut, which was very eye opening. And they had all their goats and we, you know, we're, we wanted to milk the goat and see how they lived, which it was, it was crazy. I mean, they lived in a mud hut. It's not like this is a tourist attraction. You know, I had to tell my, I'm like, oh no, this isn't a tourist track. This is how they live. Mm -hmm. And you go in this mud hut and there's just sticks that make a cot and then a leather, you know, a piece of hide as a bed. And it was a few square, you know, it was just like a few feet by a few feet. The whole family, like all the kids, there was like three or four kids that slept on all that. And then the mom and dad had their own mm -hmm. on smaller than a twin bed. Yes. This would be for reference, probably the size of most people's bathroom. I would say in America, a small bathroom, a small yeah. bathroom. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, the whole house mm -hmm. was like, yeah, it was crazy. So, and, the, and they, they, they're really proud of their porridge, right? They call it Ugali is in different formats. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Ugali is just the corn, the maize flour with water at, the, at its base. But then they were really proud of their, their porridge that they eat. And so it was the mm -hmm. corn flour and the, the water, but then they had some of the fresh milk in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They were, so it wasn't the bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it tastes. It wasn't it tastes the worst, like but regular porridge. <laughs> but yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. They'll have that in the morning. So it's interesting because the sexes eat a little bit different in the Maasai tribe. The women will often skip breakfast because they're in charge of doing the milking. So they'll go out and do the milking. And they tried to teach me how to do it, and I was not successful. Uh, <laughs> But in mul on multiple occasions, two occasions. You have to be very forceful and direct with this milking. Yeah, yeah. And I was afraid of hurting the animal. So uh, I obviously didn't grow up on a farm. But uh, but yeah, they, they have a song that they sing to the animals to soothe the animals. It's really quite lovely, to be honest. The Maasai use song in, in most of their rituals and most of their daily rituals, they have a set song for each thing. But the women usually will go off without breakfast and then do two meals a day. They'll come back and do their lunch and then their dinner. And the men will sometimes do three meals, although often two as well. And the children tend to do three. So, uh, so they eat a bit different. The men tend to do two cups of milk in the morning and then and just depending, maybe they'll go until evening, sometimes lunch. And the the kids will usually do some milk or milk and porridge in the morning and then go to school and then have their dinner at home. But what was insightful for me, I don't know if this was for you, it was I had not realized beforehand that the Maasai don't eat milk and meat on the same day. Uh, that was very mm -hmm. fascinating to me that they'll, they'll uh, slaughter an animal. If it's a goat, they'll eat it all in one day. Yeah, this needs to be discussed, actually. They only eat fresh food. They don't trust any food that lasts for a long time. So uh, many of the Maasai uh, communities that we talked to did uh, really limited 
the maze or didn't do it because they were concerned about the shelf life and then others were doing it, but they were concerned about the shelf life. They, they don't do uh, food that's been out for a long time. They're, they're very uh, strict about that. They don't believe in that, which was interesting to me as a practitioner because that would lower histamines greatly with their diet that's already a low histamine diet as carnivore diets are despite the histamine in the food. So, uh, so that was really fascinating to see and the milk traditionally is always raw and now they're starting to cook it. Like, so this community that you and I went to, this house that uh, was hurting, they were cooking the milk uh, some of the time. And so that's a newer kind of development in this community as well. But some of the elders still do the raw milk instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and it was interesting that they, well, they did that and, oh man, I forgot what I was gonna say. Yeah, I'll, I'll step in and then you remember, okay. So with a goat, they'll kill the goat and eat it in one day. So they'll drink the blood and they'll eat the meat and then they'll have their herb soup or stew as they would call it. And they'll call it herbs, plural, but it's just that one plant mm -hmm. that they use over and over again. It's not even an herb. It's like a pepper root. It's, it's just a, a white. <laughs> it's a root that's peppery. So yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then and then they'll do the, the milk and the blood for usually about three days. And then they'll slaughter another animal. If it's a cow that they're slaughtering, then that will last for three days. So they'll eat some and then they'll smoke the rest for the second and the third day as well. But what was also really interesting uh, to me was that they they strongly are against eating chicken and fish and other animals. It's basically like goat and cattle and sometimes sheep, but it's not preferred. That is interesting. And they actually, Clemens would say that eating bush meat was like beneath them because yes. they talk about the Hadza and, and if they go out hunting, they're like, no, that's not for us. That's how you become a bush person. We are not bush people. We are the proud Maasai. And you and yeah, you could cool. see that too. I, I really felt uh, spending time with both, uh, both communities, the Maasai seemed so much healthier and also so elegant. You know, I, I was really taken aback by their elegance. I think maybe from my readings mm -hmm. and hearing about how they're carnivore and they eat all this meat, maybe I put some, some, uh, uh, odd notions mm. on that and and I found their diet and their way of life extremely elegant they're they're really good artisans they're very calm and healthy people and very friendly and open I found the women very engaging with me and very kind uh, very loving to be perfectly honest and and really a very civilized very civilized beautiful culture and society and and all of their meat was uh, I, I don't know, I, I hate to use the word elegant again, but that was really my takeaway. It was gentle when they got the blood. It was a gentle process when they would slaughter an animal. The The milk was lovingly procured through the song and uh, and everything was very clean. It, it just seemed very clean for a place that doesn't use soap or wash, you know, wash with soap and water and those kind of things. Everything just seemed very, very clean to me despite that. It was very much like that. And maybe, I mean, I guess there's other tribes and other places and there's Kenya, which we didn't get to go yes. to, but all the, the guys I spent time with were so just mild mannered and kind and they were so cool. Like it's, it's hard to explain. Like they were kind of these warrior people in a way, but they're also just very kind and welcoming. So yes, that was really interesting. And, mm -hmm. and then I was thinking of Clemens. So he thinks his, his dad, lived to about 110 mm -hmm. his, his dad or his grandpa his dad his, dad. his father mm -hmm. yeah his, he thinks his father is about 110 so yes these Maasai were living a lot longer than the Hadza which we'll get to later and it you know makes sense with just their, their diet and lifestyle and oh I wanted to go back to how suspicious they are of foods that last a long time so this is what Clemens said a lot in the interview and and otherwise and other people said this which I love this instinct so not only the, the histamines will be lower if you're eating it fresh like you're saying I'm just loving this idea of theirs because they don't trust the, the cooking oils and the modern foods and all that stuff so Clemens was really against he's like it lasts forever on the store shelf and this instinct that you don't want to eat anything that lasts a long time is very good because the worst foods last the longest. Yes. Right? Yes. It's a good motto to live by. 
so they they have good instincts there and you could also tell that the elderly would yeah they were the healthiest mm -hmm. and they were always just more skeptical of the new new things that were coming in and they they're like this is why they're unhealthy or you know these my kids aren't going to live as long as me or they're dying early they're getting more disease and they can see it they see it the new foods moving in yeah, it was great because with the Maasai, uh, with more elders in those communities, they could really speak to what they've seen over the generations and how the health is starting to decline. And, you know, to us Americans, it may seem very minor or Europeans or anyone else listening, it may seem minor because we've so normalized chronic illness in our culture and, and urgent illness in our culture as well. And when you speak with them, they talk about how, especially the ones like uh, the second community we went to raises or grows corn, grows maize, but they grow it to sell and trade. So they don't actually eat it in the second group that we went to. So they're still on their traditional diet. And they were interesting because many of them, had, many of the men I talked to had gone to college and had come back because they found this way of life to be much healthier, that they felt better, they enjoyed it. They kind of wanted to hybrid their life, to be honest. They wanted to live in the Maasai way and eat that way, but they wanted to also be in politics and these kind of things. But um, but yes, yeah. So you could really see the decline in the generations. And, and I think it was Clemens who really gave us the insight that one of the major issues that's happening with, with these communities that's impacting their health is the schools. So the schools have come in with an altruistic attempt to educate uh, everyone. But the problem is, is that these schools are feeding the children corn and beans, and this is not a traditional Maasai diet. And so, I, you know, the kids are coming home saying that maize is healthy for us, we should be eating maize, vegetable oil is healthy, these kind of things, and then eating their traditional foods uh, for breakfast and for dinner. And it's causing it's causing uh, confusion, and, and I really think we're gonna see even more of the generational decline in health as this continues. Yeah, that's the next thing I wanted to bring up. Mm -hmm. We visited a school and we saw three full classrooms of these kids. And I mean, yeah, it seemed like the younger ones weren't doing as well. You know, you kind of mm -hmm. see a little bit of this stuff going on. And, and they showed us their food shed, which was quite alarming. It was this little, you know, it was a building that uh, they had locked, you know, they opened up the locked door and went in. And in there was a couple little sacks of sugar some jugs of vegetable oil and a big trash can full of maize flour. Yeah. And they're like, this is their food. So while they're at school, this is what they eat. And I'm like, oh man, this looks like we set this up for the Food Lies film about how bad it could be. Because yes. you just lined up the three worst things. You got the sugar flour oil and that's all they have. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really looked like a setup and it was so depressing to be honest. So it was this side little room and I asked uh, William who was kind of guiding us around uh, if I could go into that room and if we could go into that room, not realizing that that was the food storage because it was really quite meager. You know, it wasn't, it, beans and rice don't take up a lot of space, right? So, or beans and corn mm -hmm. and vegetable oil. So it was just this like depressing pile of things in the corner of this of this room. It almost looked like something that belonged in a garage. And yet this is, this is what they're giving the children. And and when you talk to the elders and you ask them health questions, their responses are things that I'm so grateful we caught on video because I think people just wouldn't believe. I think they'd think we were romanticizing things or that people couldn't possibly be that healthy. Uh, but you can, you can see in the interviews, people talking about how different it is for those who are 40 or those who are 20. And yet these are still communities where with all the children, you don't see any blatant signs of autism. You don't see any blatant signs of a lot of the health conditions that we've normalized. I mean, these kids were learning multiple languages when they were three and four and very young children. They're very social. They're very friendly. Everyone wants a hug. Everyone makes eye contact. You can pick them up. They're very, uh, they're very calm of temperament. So we didn't hear one temper tantrum with any of the communities <laughs> in all the weeks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yet, uh, generationally there, there is an issue because as they're getting older, they're starting to get the health issues that we get, uh, in, in the other countries and that the elders are immune to from their diet. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, that's the one common theme through all the communities was a pretty linear decline. The, the elderly were the most healthy yeah. and then you could kind of see it creeping in. Although, you know, they, they're doing well. A lot of the people were doing well, even though they were still, you know, yeah getting into some more modern diets, mm -hmm. uh, it seemed like there was that trend or yes. at least the oldest generation said that we, everyone just died of old age. And then they're like, oh, well now, you know, my sons and daughters, they're dying of, you know, this or that. Yes. That right? was really interesting because I think it relates to American and European history very well. You know, if you go back about a hundred years, 150 years, people started to become very prone to infection. And one thing that all the elders discussed was that no one ever got malaria no one ever got anything. And now they're starting to see it in those that live a more modern life. And so you can see observationally that one's immune system does not work as well when you adopt the modern foods, even if it's as small as vegetable oil and maize, because, you know, I, I want to really emphasize, we are not talking about people that eat ice cream. These folks don't eat any dessert. Uh, they're not eating bread. They're not eating mm -hmm. Pop-Tarts or anything else. It's just maize and, and vegetable oil, but that can be enough in, in them to make them prone to infections like malaria, dengue fever, African sleeping sickness, these kind of things. It's still not common, but it was enough for the elders to make a point of it, that this is not something that happened before. And now we start to see it, which is what happened after the industrial revolution in Europe and America too. We became more prone to infection. We had several pandemics that went through. And then later, you know, 1940s and on, you start to see more of the health conditions in elderly years. So really 50 plus, you start to see health conditions. So. Uh, diabetes come in and heart disease and these kind of things. And they're starting to see that in some communities. We didn't see it in the Maasai, but in some of the other communities that we went to, other tribes or clans, we would see uh, the diabetes set in in some people when they were about 80 or 90. So uh, they were pretty immune and lived a very healthy life until very elderly years. But those who had adopted some modern foods would see that. Whereas in the regions that hadn't, at least no one could speak of any uh, cases of any kind of illness. They, they kind of looked at us like we were aliens when we would ask them about it. So, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, you can see this, it happens throughout history mm -hmm. and it, it, there's different time scales that it happens on. Right. And now, so it happened to the U S and all these Westernized countries and now it's happening to them and you can just see the writing on the wall, how it just gradually comes in and, and, it lowers their life expectancy and more disease and all that. Oh, it's sad. It's sad, but that's, I guess it's part of our, yeah, our modernization, right? It's it what is. Happens. It is. And we're lucky in that we can, we can see it on this global scale so we can actually do mm -hmm. something about it. Um, you know, so often things have to get worse before they get better because it makes us see what's going on. And I think that's one thing that this trip was very helpful for yeah well let's talk about the second group so mm -hmm. we were lucky enough to do a completely different experience with a completely different messiah group in a different location and so i should put a caveat too about all the stuff we're talking about we're not experts we visited you know a couple people we can't say this is how every messiah lives or everything right so we're not trying to say that we know everything about them but at least we got to see multiple people from multiple clans and communities in different places right so I just wanted to put that out there because fully agree. It's and so also, different, right? Yes. Yeah, so with the Messiah, there's about three hundred thousand that are are living right now, and they they are in a huge region that spans multiple countries. Really, three. You know, many would argue that the Samburu up in Kenya are really Messiah as well, and the Karamoja over in Uganda are Messiah as well. They speak the same language, and they do the blood and the milk and these kind of things, and they have all been uh, touched by modern civilization and to different degrees. And so you're going to see really different things when you go to each different clan. And each clan is going to have a very different experience based on their environment and what has happened. Like with, with Clemens, he used to live in the Ningoro Goro crater in the basin. That's where his village was. And when the national park was set, uh, you know, his 
his people were moved up to the top, which really changes how you live, how animals are going to function, if you can graze the cattle and all these kinds of things. And this has happened to each of these communities individually. So some of them, like um, like Augustine's clan that <laughs> he told us about from the beginning, they had been touched by you know maize and corn much earlier than some of the other Maasai groups had. And so, yeah, it's going to really vary. So this is just Brian and, and my experience experience on uh, visiting uh, a few different, uh, well, actually, you know, we went to two different areas with Maasai, but the first one was really a unique experience in that we got to speak to one's uh, Maasai members from from different uh, clans, which was really yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, different communities. So that was really nice. But yes, I mean, it's a small microscopic look at a very large <laughs> community in a large region. Yeah. And, you know, when I was talking to Kimaki, he was a Maasai guy. Mm -hmm. You know, he wasn't super, super tall. And I was asking him where he said in Kenya, a lot of them are a lot taller. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe these people in Kenya were, you know, living more traditionally for longer or, this, you know, there's all different things going on. Yeah. I will say observationally that Lang Lang, as we like to call him, <laughs> seemed the healthiest mm. of everyone. And he was the one that was diving in for the blood and diving in for the, <laughs> the milk. <laughs> he was just all about it. And that is from, from my studies, uh, you know, what I understand is that the Maasai warriors really do keep the traditional diet. It's the, the other members that, that adopt uh, more of the, of the maize and that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the second community. So yeah. we we got there in the morning and they they have it was really cool. They have these circular things, concentric circles. So the, the outer circle was kind of the huts and they have these brambles and thorns that kind of protect them. Yeah. And then the inner circle, they had all their cattle. And it's so simple. You just throw some brand, you know, some bushes with all these thorns and you have a fence that's impenetrable. And uh, we got to. Uh, experience the whole blood and milk thing, which is which is very intense. So maybe you could just kind of walk us through that. Sure, that was fascinating. So first, the women went and collected the milk again because uh, set gender roles in all of these communities that we went to, but especially the Maasai. So the women have a set role, and their role is child rearing, cooking, and then also uh, getting the milk. So uh, the women went around and and sang the songs and uh, got the milk from the cows and. It was a huge bacterial exchange, I will say. They pulled me up with them and tried to show me how to do it. And I was wildly, wildly inept. Yeah. But it was fascinating to see the bacterial exchange because the calf was nursing at the same time as we were getting the milk and the the slobber from the calf was getting into our milk and her hand was <laughs> everywhere and we're stepping the in. The dirt was everywhere. The dirt was everywhere and we're stepping in, in cow dung as we go. Uh, although they have brilliantly designed sand to keep their feet clean, but we can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. And and then uh, they collected all the milk into gourds. So they use gourds. They don't eat the pumpkin or the the uh, the fruit. They just use the gourd. Mm -hmm. They dry it out and they use that as containers for the milk, for the blood, and other things as well. And so calabash. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, calabash. It's calabash. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So they collected the blood or the milk into that while the men were preparing. Uh, kind of. Uh, grabbing a, a cow, uh, a bull. So they, they only bleed the, the bulls, not the, not the cows. And they rotate it. So maybe it'll get bled once a month. You know, we got varying answers, but usually it wasn't more frequently than that. One thing I don't know about you, Brian, I was blown away by the sheer abundance of food that they had and the uh, abundance of their environment, like with that fence, how simple everything was and everything was there for them to use. You know, mm -hmm. there was no, no, no sense of lack amongst them. But, mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, so then the men, uh, prepared the arrow and uh, shot the mm. shot the bull and the blood oh, came out. So I think they were successful. What on the second or third try, something like that. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. and, well, it was it was really intense. So they, uh, yeah. I th I was wondering, is there a better way to do this? But they had to kind of put a rope around it. You get the big jugular vein to pop out, yeah. and then from just a foot away, you. you use the arrow and it's a very short tip. It's like a special tip. It's not like a normal arrow. And then they, and you just hit the, hit the vein and it just starts spurting oh, out. <laughs> and then they collect it. They get the calabash and they put it on really quickly to collect it. And I post this on Instagram and people 
went crazy. And they're like, I can't believe you're showing a cow dying. Like, why didn't they make it quicker? Why not a quicker death? I was like, this is cow is not dying. <laughs> this is their prized possession. It gives them food every month. Like, yeah. this is just the equivalent of a human giving a pint of blood. I mean, they gave maybe so cows like, you know, eight times bigger than us. And maybe it was no, they're not eight. times. They're probably like this cow is probably like four to five times our size. And maybe it gave five pints instead of a human giving one pint and then it's fine they patch it up with some dung and dirt and it's good yeah the cow was actually fine he wasn't distressed at all when he was bleeding like or being shot he just wasn't distressed mm -hmm. the other cows weren't worried about him they showed no sign of distress and that's why i say mm -hmm. the diet despite what people might perceive like from the photos as uh brutal or uh rough is is actually very mm -hmm. smooth and clean and quick <laughs> so they they get the blood and they collect it in the calabash and then they grab some soil from the earth and patch it up and the cow goes off and enjoys its day it's it's not tired it's not weak it's not upset it's not stressed in any way uh, it was it's really pretty nice and one takeaway i got from this whole experience from that and then we'll circle back to drinking the blood and the milk was mm -hmm. how radiantly healthy their animals were. The Maasai, unlike even say the Amish in, in the States who also rear animals, take utmost pride in their animals. They treat them so well. I've personally never seen healthier animals anywhere around the world. The, the fur and the skin just glowed and they were thick, they weren't bony. Um, you didn't see any illnesses, any areas lacking skin like you'll see even on like camels in Egypt. Uh, they just really prize their animals. And so for those who were worried about the cow dying, that's just not something they would ever allow. Uh, because again, the their cattle are their show of wealth. And so although they'll slaughter a cow for eating, they more often do the goats, right? And these kind of things. And But even the goats are perfectly healthy. And, and to be honest, they're very gentle with all of them. Like I saw them uh, a kid had just been born and a kid goat and uh, and they were very gentle with that kid and they snuggled it and hugged it. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like the animals were for their use. They really respected and cared for the animals. But circling back to the to the blood and the milk, when I had it, I was jumping in. I don't know about you, Brian. Mm -hmm. I was jumping in because the blood had mm -hmm. tasted so surprisingly good to me. So I was very excited about this. And when I had it, so it was the mix of the blood and the milk, it was like, okay, but it wasn't as exciting as the blood on its own for me. But I think you had a different mm -hmm. experience, right? Did you like the blood and the milk well, mix more? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I definitely like the blood and the milk mix more. I guess I'm always just, I love c combinations of things maybe, or just the milk made it more smooth and mild. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I guess to finish it off, they, they, they collected the blood in the calabash and then they had more of this bigger dish of the milk and then they combined it. Mm -hmm. They kind of just combined it to just straight from the cow. Mm -hmm. And then everyone just took turns drinking out of this one bowl, this yes. like metal bowl which is really cool. But yeah, I mean, it tasted delicious to me. I thought it was the best thing out of all the things we tried. I think the blood and the milk mixture was the best. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just like a creamy, delicious sort of animal-based milkshake. Yes, and it was very filling, both it and the blood, but especially the milk with the blood was very filling. I remember not really wanting, so we did that early in the morning and I remember not really wanting to eat for the rest of the day. I did, but I didn't <laughs> feel like I needed to. Well, they, they didn't. So, I mean, these guys, that's all they ate, mm -hmm. you know, for how many hours? Like, that was their meal. Like, it wasn't just like, oh, let's do this little tourist thing and we'll do a little thing. No, this that was their meal. And then they went off on their day and then maybe they had dinner. Mm -hmm. And that's traditionally how they went about it because the men would often, especially during the dry season, take the cattle out and go really far away from the villages. And so that's what they would mostly subsist on would be the blood and the milk because they wouldn't want to kill an animal in that situation because they were using it for the blood and the milk. And so they would bring a lot of cattle over there and do that for, for a few months traditionally. Um, but yeah, I, I like what you brought up about the communal eating I and mean, we shared germs with a lot of people <laughs> that's just not done in yeah. many parts of the world anymore oh yes and no well i need to bring this up the COVID part people might think it's crazy to one go to africa travel around all this stuff drink you know share germs with all these people 
that was my that's my strategy to not get COVID is how to have a strong immune system is to be exposing myself to all this. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can agree or disagree with me. I don't know what you think about that. Maybe you could. No, I agree. I, I really feel from what I've seen in my private practice, what I've experienced in my own body and what I see historically and ancestrally through all these uh, studies around the world, I really feel that infections are when you get an infection it's saying that your body isn't healthy to begin with and so the best thing you can do is make your body as strong as possible and that's by getting it metabolically healthy getting lots of natural sunshine eating uh, traditional fats traditional diets wherever it's from and then exposing yourself to germs i mean these communities that we went to the maasai were probably i i think and you, you tell me if if you disagree, I think the mm -hmm. Maasai were probably the cleanest of the of the groups that we went to. But uh, but, you know, I mean, the the bowls were being shared by everyone. There wasn't soap being used. These kind of things, of course, mm -hmm. uh, all of those sorts of things. So uh, so, yeah, I think exposing yourself to a lot of things, for instance, uh, most people go around barefoot, yet there's jiggers mm. everywhere. And there's uh, jiggers are, well, they're, they're awful. Don't look them up. You'll have nightmares. But there's mm. all sorts of things that you can get just from the soil alone. And yet so many people don't until they move into the cities, uh, until they lose their traditional diet, their traditional lifestyle. And so I really think if you're living in line with it, with nature, you're, you're far more protected. And that plus germ exposure is a, a really good idea. Yeah. And to finish off the COVID thing, it was just interesting in Tanzania, there was no COVID. Mm -mm. I mean, it just didn't exist. Yeah. It didn't exist. We got into the city. There was, I think, 25 people in one van. Like they were people seriously pressed against the ceiling. People were out the window. Like there was just n nothing, no problems ever. I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I, we went to hospitals. We went to COVID yeah. clinics. There was no one there. No one. It was I, it was like a a tomb. There was no one there. <laughs> yeah, there's we, just we sat at one COVID place for two hours, for, which is a different story. We didn't <laughs> see anyone there. It was just us. So I, I don't know. Well, I just posted a study about how correlated obesity is mm. to the outcomes. How many deaths per thousand? Mm. And if you have over fifty percent of your population. Obe uh, overweight or obese, you had 10 times as many deaths yeah. and just everything was so much worse with COVID. And then you look at, they had all these maps and in, in Africa, they have a very low obesity rate and they have very, very low COVID rates. Same thing with, yeah. you know, Japan and some of these Asian countries, very low obesity, very low COVID. And it's very, it, it, it was, it was, it was striking that how it, how much it matters is, your metabolic health. It is the thing that no one wants to talk about or doesn't seem to talk about, but is so important. And I'm so grateful you are um, taking that on because obesity lowers your immune function. And scientifically, we have known this for a long time. So when there's a pandemic going on and we have a huge obese or overweight population, those countries are going to be riddled with the pandemic. And regions that are metabolically healthy and of normal weight will have a completely different picture. It may not be a pandemic at all. And so it really uh, brings thing ho things home that when we're sick, when we're obese, it's not our fault, but it is our responsibility to fix because it does impact others. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, when it's over 50%, it seems like it's, it spreads more. There, there's mm -hmm. a hard, there's an amazing graph where there's a threshold and once yeah. below 50% obesity is very, very, very low COVID death rate. And then once you get of that 50%, very, very high, it's like a huge jump. And it yeah. seems to be this, this spreading and people are talking about, oh, you need to wear a mask to protect me. From these studies, it seems like you need to not be obese to protect me because that's when you get to that threshold, that's how it spreads more because there's such ill health. And I should just make sure people know there was zero mask in Tanzania. I'm, I'm talking about 25 people in a van without a mask. There was no mask. <laughs> no I mean, one wears Uganda, masks. Oh, in Uganda, maybe there was a few masks. You know, if you go to like the, the hospital or in the airport, yes, there were masks in Uganda in the airport and stuff like that. But in Tanzania or anywhere else we went, there were no masks. 
<laughs> there were none. zero masks. <laughs> none. Okay. None at all. So... <laughs> and that that 50% uh, picture that you pull up is something that you see across nature, whether it's talking about cleaning up pollution from a river. If you get 50% clean, then the body, the, the river will take over and clean up the rest of it. That 50% tipping point seems to be a, a pattern mm -hmm. in nature. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it's just creating ripe soil <laughs> for, for the pandemic for us in America. Wow. All right. Mm -hmm. So we're at an hour here. What if, what do we want to end with? There's a lot of questions we got. So we want to answer some of those. Mm -hmm. And Mary asked a lot of them herself to these, to these people that we visited. So maybe you could start answering some just on the Maasai sure. specifically. Mm -hmm. How often do they eat? How much do they eat? Just mm -hmm. what do they eat? Weaning foods, what portion of their diets? Just anything about the food, can you kind of recap that for us? Okay, sure. Uh, well, uh, like I said earlier, men and women eat differently. Women tend to do more of the intermittent fasting. Men, it varies based on what season it is and what kind of work they're doing. So they'll either have three or two meals as well. Children are more likely to have three. Um, their portions are until they get full. They have tons of food. <laughs> so, so they eat until they're full, but they have good appetites. However, I didn't see, I don't know about you, I didn't see anyone anxious to eat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, very calm. Do someone asked if they have any problems with dairy? Well, that's obvious with the Maasai. No, it's a sacred Absolutely food not. to them. Yeah, they they really love it, and there weren't any dairy intolerances. I dairy. Do you want me to speak to dairy intolerance quickly? Yeah. Okay. So we see dairy intolerance coming from a couple different things. One is breed of cow. Uh, the in in this region of Africa, in this region of Tanzania and Uganda that we went to, there were not um, there were not Holsteins or Frisian breeds of cow, which create the beta. A1 casein. That's the protein that humans tend to have issue with. These are cows that produce A2, uh, which is a, a non-problematic lectin for humans to break down. So it doesn't create the same kind of inflammation. That's often people's issue with dairy is the breed of cow, to be perfectly honest. But for those who go further, it can be the pasteurization. So in America, we've been pasteurizing our dairy for a long time in many other parts of the world as well. And the problem with that is that when you have raw dairy, say raw milk, for instance, like the Maasai do, it comes with its own enzymes to break it down. As soon as you heat that milk product, it, it kills or it gets rid of the enzyme, it, it heats it away. And so when you drink that pasteurized milk product, you have to uh, go through, you actually deplete part of your own stores of enzymes to break that product down. And so if you're raised on uh, like we were, right? You and I both had the same childhood with this, just that terrible milk that we had to have. Uh, mm -hmm. It really depletes you. It actually, you have to eat part of your own body in order to break that down. And so you become deficient. And at a certain point, you'll hit a tipping point where you can't break it down anymore because you don't have any more stores of that enzyme. So for some people, it's as simple as going back to unpasteurized, properly raised dairy, and that's fine. If it goes further than that, I've only seen one or two cases in my entire career of it not being the A1A2 issue or the raw versus pasteurization issue, uh, you're dealing with a potassium deficiency. Now, the Maasai get plenty of potassium. They're eating from the right breed of cow and they're traditionally eating the milk raw. So they don't have any of those issues. So you don't see any of the dairy intolerances. That's great. Mm -hmm. And then people are asking about salt. We're always curious about salt, yeah. but they get with your drinking the blood, you're mm -hmm. getting all the minerals from the blood. Yes. Yeah. And they're actually right. very proud that they don't eat salt, uh, but they, they don't need it. People ask, do people snack? No, not at all. They don't, not the Maasai. They, they just eat. Well, yeah. Like you said, two to three times a day. Do, are they in ketosis? which is interesting. Yeah, the one, you know, we only tested a handful of them, so I can't speak for, for everyone, but they were all in very mild ketosis, like 0.1 with very healthy blood sugar. It was fascinating. Yeah, very good blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, do they make cheese and ferments from milk? Not usually. They will make butter for the babies. So the babies, when they start to wean from the mother's milk, they're fed a lot of butter. And that's uh, also though the women will shake the milk to create butter. Also, if someone's been sick as well, but usually it's just the milk. And then just all about the, the normal chronic things that we have in society. People are asking about 
digestive discomfort, bloating, joint pain, PMS, migraine, any of that type of stuff? Yeah. Okay. First of all, it, zero arthritis, zero joint pain. Those guys and women are very robust and healthy. They can jump, they can dance. Uh, no issues there. They're faster than I was. And uh, for women, I thought as a female, it was fascinating because uh, zero period cramps. They, they don't even know what they are. And uh, infertility doesn't exist at all in, in these two communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, childbirth is two hours. And they also, the women are fed a different diet when they're pregnant, which was really interesting. So they're given a lot of liver and milk and meat for the first six months of a pregnancy. And then at the six month mark, they're switched to heated milk and only cooked meat. So they don't do the raw anymore or the raw liver anymore either. You know, I, mm -hmm. I've heard of that in, in America too. So I'm, all my friends seem to be pregnant these days. <laughs> And they, they're just advised to not eat this. It seems like their doctors are just worried about pathogens. You know, yeah. it's like you're saying pasteurize the milk or don't eat the raw. It, it seems like more not for nutrition, mm -hmm. but to make sure the baby doesn't get sick through pathogens. I think that is it. And unlike uh, us in the States, you know, women are very much advised to avoid raw things for the baby uh, once it's born and also to avoid raw things in their own diet, like sushi and honey and egg yolk. But that is a difference. With the Maasai culture, as soon as the baby is born, the woman goes back to eating the raw food again. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, anything else? Any other revelations? They didn't. They had no problems with sleep. They had no yeah. problems with depression. That I mean, everything. I don't. I don't know. We, we can't just list them all because they just didn't seem to have any of these things. Yeah. Like they were just. They're like, no, we live life, we feel great, and then one day we die. Yes, they literally have none of it. And they pull they pull teeth out as part of the, the male ritual. So when you see pictures, they're often missing the lower incisors, uh, but that's not from tooth loss or rot. So yeah, no, they're very healthy. They don't tend to get cavities. If they do, it's when they're very, very old, maybe they'll lose a tooth, but um, they said even that is very, very rare. Yeah, no, no mental illness, no autism. Um, um, just literally none of the things that we think are so normal have ever existed there. That is very true. So anything else on the Maasai? What, what, did, what was your big takeaway? Or maybe you could talk mm -hmm. about the difference between um, them and the other tribes we saw. I found them to be very healthy in contrast. I mean, there were quite a few tribes I felt were very healthy and I, I would happily live there. With the Maasai, mm -hmm. I felt like, gosh, I really want to set up a, a way for people to go and stay and eat the traditional diet for a few weeks for their health to, you know, restore themselves. Because I feel like the Maasai diet, more than many of the other ones, is is a great remedy when you've been very sick. You know, uh, all the food is very fresh. It's very soft. Well, aside from the meat, the meat is very tough. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> But very, hey, hey, we could have just got a bad batch. You yeah, know? we could have gotten a bad batch. It was very nourishing, very rich in the fat soluble vitamins. And also just the whole environment is very lovely and joyful and beautiful, really beautiful. I think a big takeaway for me was that uh, I had always read about this region being, you know, and I've spent a lot of time in Africa, but I hadn't been to this region. And I had read about this region being really infested with infections. And it was really impressive how, uh, how protected they were from it unless they went to the cities and started eating the the modern diet absolutely mm -hmm. and uh, you did talk about the teeth a little bit but we'll just mm -hmm. emphasize amazing Gorgeous. wide dental arch the whole thing the, the exactly like weston price talked about mm -hmm. and i the maasai had less of the little discoloration right yeah. some people had some discoloration which we were trying to figure out if it was because of the water mm -hmm. or what was going on there but what was your interpretation of yeah um, i think it was regional because most had beautiful white pearly teeth and then there were a couple of the guys specifically at the first maasai village uh that had the the discoloration from the fluoride in the water uh but they also they were younger so while they were very fit uh, my question is is if they're eating more of the the corn. So I think more research needs to be done. I know all the studies that have been done on this point towards the, the mineral deposits in the water, but I, I have to wonder, mm -hmm. since it's not everyone, if the diet is involved as well. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, 
This was great. We're going to come back for another podcast on the Hadza, and then we're going to do another one on the Batwa, the Pygmies in Uganda. And then we're going to do a fourth one on the Chaga, the Toga, and other communities, like the city communities we saw. So that will be our final episode. So I hope everyone's looking forward to those. And yeah, we can uh, answer some more questions maybe in the next episodes if people want to reach out to Mary or I on social media. And where can people find you, Mary? Oh, uh, enableyourhealing.com or Mary Reddick CNC on Instagram. Awesome. Well, can't wait for round two. Thanks. Me either. (laughs) Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for giving a review on iTunes or any podcast app. Thanks for sharing with family or friends. Go to nosetotail.org for all the meat and body care products and seasonings and biltong. Go to sapien.org to be part of the tribe. Get all the special features and perks and show notes and bonus episodes. Sapien.org for the program so you can lose weight, reverse disease can do it remotely anywhere in the world. And come back next week for some more. We will be talking about the Hadza and our experience hunting with them and eating brains and raw liver. It's going to be awesome. See you soon. Bye.